and best friends. We all have different religions, but we have universal love as well. <laughs> I love my sister. Love is love. Our family is no less than any other family. The name of that video <clears throat> is Love Has No Labels. You may have seen it on television in a shorter 30-second spot. That's where I first encountered it. But that video right there is from YouTube. It was uploaded exactly one year ago today. And to say that that video is popular would be a rather large understatement. Let me just give you some facts here. The average number of views a video gets on YouTube depending on its category, ranges from two to 9,000, which is pretty amazing in itself. That video has been viewed over 56 million times. If you add Facebook shares, it's been seen well over 100 million times. To put that into perspective, there are literally millions, if not billions of videos on YouTube. That one ranked fourth in all of 2015 as most, fourth most watched video. Let me give you a little background. About a month ago, I sent an email to the staff, uh, included that video in it. I had saw it on TV. I had some thoughts, and so I, I included that, and I said, you know, here are my thoughts. What are your thoughts? And we do that from time to time because we'll come across an article or something that uh, we think everybody would benefit from, and I, I've learned so much from my brothers and sisters uh, on staff. Well, I got really one response, and it was Pastor Mike, and he said, well, Mike, I think you ought to stand up in front of the entire congregation and talk about it. <laughs> it's like, um, uh, that's not exactly what I was thinking about, but here we are. So the next time you, you are sending an email to Pastor Mike, before you click send, <laughs> think twice, okay? <laughs> think twice. The video is produced by the Ad Council, which is short for Advertising Council. They're a nonprofit organization. They produce, distribute, promote videos just like that that are called public service announcements or PSAs. And many of us, we've grown up with PSAs. They, they gave us such iconic figures as Smokey the Bear, which was 1944. You know, only you can prevent forest fires. McGruff, the crime dog, 1978, take a bite out of crime. Just say no, Nancy Reagan, 1982. So the Ad Council didn't just burst on the scene. They have been with us as part of our culture for many, many decades. Their latest campaign, the Love Has No Labels, 
was introduced on a day when many of us, we have love on the brain. And that would be February 14th, Valentine's Day. And what you just witnessed is a high-quality production. I don't think this was just thrown together. It's actually quite the collaboration. You had the financial backing of some big-time corporations. You've heard of them, Procter & Gamble, Allstate, State Farm, Coke, and Pepsi, throwing their financial uh, weight to this video. You got a song in the background. Some of you may recognize that song. It was really popular a few years ago called Same Love by Macklemore and Ryan Lewis. And that song is so popular, it's also known as the Gay Anthem. The song was performed during the 2014 Grammy Awards when the artists were perform they, while they were performing, they were joined on stage by Queen Latifah, who oversaw and officiated the weddings of 33 same sex and opposite sex couples. Also, part of the campaign is the, the absolutely beautiful voice of Mary Lambert. She sang, I can't change, even if I tried, even if I wanted to. And you might guess that she is a, a self professed lesbian who is a strong advocate in support of the LGBTQ movement. In case you're not familiar with what that is, that's your lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning. So you take big-time corporations, provide the financial means, talented musical artists, a slick advertising company that knows how to sell, creative idea, good-looking people, cute kids. You have the formula for something that is very, very powerful. I don't know if you've seen that before. I, I've seen it numerous times now. It, it still impacts me. And I think part of that is because they use something that is very, very influential in our society today, and that is emotional appeal. The video has drawn some strong emotional reaction. You might wonder about that, like, well, Mike, was it, was it positive? Was it negative? What, what, was people, what was the response? Well, there's 3,000 comments on the video. I went through maybe 1,000 of them. Here's a sample. This video is so heartwarming. I started crying. One of the most touching videos of all time. This video gave me chills. It has such a beautiful message that more people need to understand. I'm happy for all of them. This just made my day. I'm teary-eyed. The disliked are sinners and should go to hell. This shows me that there's still hope in the world. This is everything that the world should be. Oh, that little boy looks so happy. This was so sweet. Who would dislike this? And finally, I love this video so much. O-M-F-G. I think I'm on some pretty solid ground if I was to say not everybody in here would have that same reaction. I suppose, since we are a diverse group, we might actually have a bit of mixed reaction in this room. But I think we all realize that just because something is popular doesn't make it true, good, valuable, you know, right. So let's look into the video a little bit. Let, let's practice our discernment skills here today. And let's, like I said earlier, put it under the lens of Scripture to see if this is consistent with biblical love. The official title of the video is Love Has No Labels Slash Diversity and Inclusion. Let's take that word inclusion first. There's a couple of words in our society today, kind of buzzwords, that you don't want to get tagged with either one of these. If you do, you're, you're done. You're, you're like the, officially the worst person in the world. And those two words are judgmental and intolerant. I think the, the video is very clearly stating, hey, you need to stop judging and be more tolerant. For example, one of the homosexual men, he said, our family is no less than any other family implying that people are saying that you're less than other families. If someone was to respond to him and say, Sir, with all love and due respect, yes, you are. That little boy does not have a mother, purposely. And that's because in your current relationship, you did not produce that child. Because God has made us male and female with the ability to reproduce within the context of a marriage covenant. The response, no matter how nicely you say that, the response often is, you are so judgmental. Who are you to judge? Aren't you a Christian? Don't you know what Jesus said about judging? 
Judge not, lest ye be judged. Right? I mean, isn't this how it goes? Our, ju- our culture has this, this judgment thing down cold. At least they think they do. If you turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 7, and you look at the first verse there, you see, judge not that you be not judged. There it is. It's right there on the screen. It's in there. Is that what Jesus is really saying? Whenever you take a verse and you isolate it like I just did there, you got to be very, very careful. I, I follow a, a ministry called Stand to Reason. They have a philosophy. They say, never read a Bible verse. Well, you might think that's an atheist organization. No, they're Christians. They're saying, don't isolate that one verse and not take into account the context, the verses that come before it, the verses that come after. Take into account the literary style it was written in. Take into account the author, the entire book, or the entire canon of Scripture. So we're, we're doing something very dangerous when we take a single verse like that. What Jesus is getting at, and we can see this in the context, is that we ought not judge hypocritically. If you look in there, you'll see that Jesus is warning us against judging someone else when we are sinning in the same way, if not worse. That's the kind of judging he's referring to. Because, in fact, the Bible often is, is telling us to judge. It's saying, hey, there's truth, there's error, there's things that are right, there's things that are wrong. You've got to be discerning. You've got to figure that out. And the statement itself that you ought not judge is a judgment in itself. See, we're judging all the time. We're constantly judging. But to say that is self-defeating because that is a judgment on its own. If you look a few verse later, a few verses later in Matthew 7, it's interesting because Jesus, he sounds very judgmental here. He says, you hypocrite. He's saying, first, take the uh, log out of your own eye so that you'll be able to see to do what? To judge, to take the speck out of your brother's eye. We need to be able to, one, discern the truth, and then second, speak that truth in love. In addition to being judgmental, the other word gets thrown out there is intolerant. In recent years, there, there's been a shift in the, the definition of what tolerance really means. The traditional definition means to recognize and respect other beliefs and practices without sharing them. Or to put it another way, to put up with someone or something that you don't like or agree with. That's true tolerance. Notice, under that definition, we can't tolerate someone unless we disagree with them. Let me say that again. We cannot tolerate someone unless we disagree. It's it's a prerequisite. It's necessary to have tolerance, disagreement. You can't tolerate someone who sees things your way, right? There's nothing to put up with there. So what's the current definition? What, What is it morphed into? Current definition says this, that all beliefs and all truth claims are equally valid. If someone says it and they really believe it, well, then it's true for them. This is a, this is a, a total denial of something called absolute truth that says that there are certain things that are true for all people at all times in all places. They deny that. This is the the opposite of one of the characteristics of love in 1 Corinthians 13 that says, love does not insist on its own way. It's not allowing for disagreement. We, We have got to be able to talk. We've got to be able to dialogue with one another, sharing perspectives, sharing our our world views with others. And undoubtedly, we have to know this going in, they ultimately or undoubtedly will collide with one another. There's going to be a collision of worldviews at times. Here's the question. Can I disagree with you without you calling me a hater or a bigot? That's, that's a good question to ask people who are, are, are playing the judgmental card or the intolerant card because you're sounding very intolerant when you do that. See, if we cannot do that, we cannot discuss and dialogue and, and, and disagree with one another, you know what you end up with? Something called ideological fascism. You may have heard that word before. I heard it recently uh, from a guy named um, Dr. Everett Piper. This is not John Piper. This is somebody different. He is the uh, president of Oklahoma Wesleyan. 
And the only reason I know of this guy is because recently he went viral. He wrote something for the, the university's website, posted on the website. Next thing he knew, he's on CNN and Fox talking about what he wrote. I have, uh, have it right here, and I want to read it to you, at least a portion of it. I, I've highlighted the relevant parts to it, but as I read this, ask yourself a question. Has he identified a, a problem in our society? Just listen to what he says. He goes, this past week, I actually had a student come forward after a university chapel service and complain because he felt victimized by a sermon on the topic of 1 Corinthians 13. It appears this young scholar felt offended because a homily on love made him feel bad for not showing love. In his mind, the speaker was wrong for making him and his peers feel uncomfortable. I'm not making this, this up. He goes, I'm not making this up, he writes. Our culture has actually taught our kids to be this self-absorbed and narcissistic. Anytime their feelings are hurt, they are the victims. Anyone who dares challenge them and thus makes them, quote, feel bad about themselves is a hater or a bigot. I have a message for this young man and all others who care to listen. That feeling of discomfort that you have after listening to a sermon is called a conscience. It is supposed to make you feel guilty. The goal of many a good sermon is to get you to confess your sins, not to coddle you in your selfishness. The primary objective of the church and the Christian faith is your confession, not your self-actualization. There are many universities across the land that will give you exactly what you want, but Oklahoma Wesleyan isn't one of them. Here, we teach you to be selfless rather than self-centered. Oklahoma Wesleyan is not a, quote, safe place, but rather a place to learn, to learn that life isn't about you, but about others, that the bad feeling you have while listening to a sermon is called guilt, and the way to address it is to repent of everything that's wrong with you rather than blame others for everything that's wrong with them. This is a place where you will quickly learn that you need to grow up. This is not a daycare. This is a university. While I was on the website, I printed off some applications for my kids to go to Oklahoma Wesleyan. I did not. But I like that guy. He doesn't pull any punches. He says it. Earlier, I read to you some of the, the comments that were in support of the video. And let's just say that not everyone agreed with the video. Okay? They, they would express their critique or dissatisfaction of it. And they don't always do it in a kind and reasonable manner. You know, it's, it's YouTube comments, right? It's not exactly the place to go for civil, intelligent dialogue. <laughs> I call it the cesspool of human depravity. It's the place where civil dialogue goes to die, basically. Some people said, hey, I'm not digging the video. I don't like it, and here's why. And they made their case. Let's just say that those comments that they received in response were not very tolerant. You're an awful person. There's no room on this earth for evil, disgusting, intolerant homophobia. It causes me pain just thinking about how stupid you are. Go whine to your imaginary friend. Your God is ashamed of you. Y'all are just haters. I know I'm kind of caricaturing that, but I imagine that was probably the sentiment behind the keyboard when they wrote those things. The responses, though, don't seem to be very inclusive. And that's because often... Intolerance, like being judgmental, is a one-way street. That was like the longest introduction in living water history, but I, but I think it was necessary. I think we got to lay that, that groundwork there. If you brought a Bible with you, and you'll turn to 1 Corinthians 13. We've been in 13 for the last two weeks now. Two weeks ago, Pastor Brian Eichelberger went through, the, uh, well, he went through his um, presentation of the Czech Republic, so we got to learn about what he's doing over there when we, those of us that are going on the mission trip, will meet up with him, and he dealt with the first three verses. Last weekend, a comedian named Pastor Ben preached on, <laughs> that was so funny, I don't know what was going on, what got into him, I mean, it was, you know, it was convicting too, and, you know, God honoring, but it was darn funny. He, he dealt with um, 4 through 13 through the rest of the chapter, but we're going to stay in 1 Corinthians 13 and look at that middle portion of the love chapter. If you'll please stand with me. <clears throat> All 
All right, verses 4 through 7, we have them on the screen. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you today in full submission to who you are. We have seen your goodness. We, we know the, 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 the holiness that you are and that your, your perfection. And your word is, is flawless. It's perfect, Lord. And I pray that you would take our thinking, which often deviates away from your truth, and you would bring us back into alignment. You'd correct us and, and, and do it with love, if you would, please. And just guide my words as we uh, discuss something that is very, very important. Give us understanding. Give us clarity, please, Lord. And have us submit ourselves under your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> In those four verses... What we see is a description of love. In those four verses, there's 15 verbs. And that's because action, or excuse me, love, I gave it away, love is an action. It's not so much a feeling, rather it's a behavior. It's something that you do. And sometimes we'll take the word love and we'll equate sex to it. You see this in words like lover or make love. Right? If I said to you, I make love to my wife every morning in the front yard, <laughs> that's going to conjure up some images in your head. Get them out. Get them out right now, okay? Some of you are thinking, Mike, you better start explaining and explaining fast, okay? Well, that's because you're thinking of something else. I'm talking about love. I don't know what you're thinking about. I said I make love to her. When I go out and I start her car, brush the snow off, turn the heat on high, get the seat covers, the seat warmers thingies that I can't stand, turn them on for her, and get that all done. I don't do that for myself. It's all for her. That's what I mean by making love. I don't know what you guys are thinking about. See, and that, that love is not about a feeling. It's not about sex. It's self-sacrificial. I don't show her love so that she'll show me sex. Because then, what? It's still about me there. I receive no benefit from this. It's self-sacrificial. And don't get it twisted because like, that's like the nicest thing I do for her. The rest of the time, it's all about me, basically. <laughs> but God is using Paul's words here to show us how love behaves. He says, here's what love looks like, and here's what it doesn't look like. Love is patient and kind. It's not arrogant and rude. These are descriptions or characteristics. And since God is the, the inventor, if you will, of the laws of logic, love cannot be patient and not patient at the same time and in the same way. That would violate the law of non-contradiction. If I said to you, right now, my car is in the parking lot, and right now, my car is not in the parking lot, you don't need to go look because you just know I said something wrong. It can't be there and not be there at the same time and in the same way. So what the Lord has done here is he's created certain boundaries. And what he's saying here is love has labels. He says it looks like this, it doesn't look like that. If you say love is rude and arrogant, God says no it isn't. Both can't be right. It's either rude and arrogant or it's not. And the video comes along and says, no, love has no labels. We have a direct contradiction right here. Either it has labels or it doesn't. It's either man's word or it's God's word. And that's exactly what this boils down to. This boils down to an issue of authority. So what does the Bible say? on this matter. Well, in case you're here today, I'm going to read some verses, but maybe you're here today 
and you are follower of certain teachers out there today. I'll name a few. Matthew Vines, Justin Lee, John Shelby Spong. If those names mean anything to you, if a trajectory hermeneutic means anything to you and you say, Mike, you're about to quote some verses, but they don't mean what you think they mean. We, we've, we've evolved onto something else. We have a newer understanding. If you're, if you're thinking that, uh, I'm not going to respond to that today. A couple reasons. One is we don't have time. The other reason, that sermon has already been preached. Pastor Mike uh, preached back in September of 2014. You can find this on our website if you care to listen. It's, uh, it's called Same-Sex Attraction and the Gospel. And what he does is he looks at six passages in Scripture, and he deals with those newer arguments that have come along to say, yeah, it doesn't mean what you thought it meant all those years. It's, it's called Understanding God's Design for Marriage. You click that, you'll find the sermon down there. So what exactly are the boundaries that God has established in his word? Let's take a look at some passages. We'll start in the Old Testament. Leviticus 18, two verses. It says there, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And you shall not lie with an animal, and so make yourself unclean with it. Nearly, uh, neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is perversion. Let's keep going into the New Testament because a lot of people in some of the research that I was doing, a lot of people, believe it or not, were saying, hey, homosexuality is stated as a sin in the Old Testament only. It doesn't say anything about uh, homosexuality in the New Testament, and that's just simply not true. Here's an example right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We covered this in our, in our walk through 1 Corinthians. Verses 9 through 11 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And verse 11 says, And such were some of you. There, there's the hope right there. Such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. One more verse from the New Testament. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Anything, and I mean anything, that deviates from God's standard of one man, one woman, in a union of a, a marriage covenant for life, anything that deviates away from that should not be considered love when God says it's a sin. We tend to focus on homosexuality. Homosexuality is simply one form, if you will, of sexual immorality. I don't know a lot of Greek words, but I do know this one. It's pornaya. I've heard it put like this. It's like a, a junk drawer term. Like you have your junk drawer at home and you just you have stuff, you don't know what to do with it, you just throw it in there. Well, it, it, it's similar. It, it functions like that in our English Bibles. It's translated sexual immorality. And it encompasses a lot. Fornication, sex before marriage. Adultery, sex outside of marriage. Incest, sex with close relatives. Bestiality, sex with animals homosexuality, pornography, lust, and more. So that means if you're here today and you're looking at pornography the way I have, you are sexually immoral. If you are sleeping with your boyfriend or girlfriend outside of a marriage covenant, you're being sexually immoral. It doesn't limit itself to homosexuality. If you lust... Guys, come on. I mean, we walk down the street, right? This, you know what Jesus said? He said, you've, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, he who even looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery with her already in his heart. We are adulterers in our heart. So before we get up on our high horse to look down on people who are uh, struggling with same-sex attraction and even giving themselves to it, didn't we once give ourselves to some sexual immorality? I have. So th that list right there, everything that I listed falls under that junk drawer term, pornaya. 
because it's all, it's all outside the boundaries that God has established. Think about it like this. Have a, you have a box, right? Consider it the, the undefiled box. Well, everything that I listed, it, it, it falls outside of that box right there. Because the video could have had other relationships presented. You could have other people coming out from behind that x-ray machine there. You could have had a 50-year-old man and a 10-year-old boy. Love has no age limit, was the video's claim. What about a teacher and a student? When we hear about that in the news, why is that so scandalous? I mean, what's wrong with it? What about a, a brother and a sister? What about a brother and three of his sisters? What about a man and a horse? You say, all right, well, you've, you've gone too far. Don't be ridiculous. Why not? Why not? Why do you draw the line there? He can't change, even if he wanted to. Love is love. The response might be, well, you know, the horse can't give consent. How do you know? Really, how do you know? You think the, the man who's given himself to bestiality, you think he's not going to make that case? He is. I love my horse. My horse loves me. They're going to say that. And, and, and I'm not trying to be funny, but what do you do with that? Are you going to label them? Or why do you draw the line at consent? There's people who like to have sex with others without their consent. They're called rapists. What about them? Well, you know, it's just wrong. Why? Are, are you citing some moral standard? Whose morality? Yours? What about his? What about mine? What about God's? Well, anything that harms people is wrong. Why is that the standard? There are people who like to be harmed. They're called masochists. What about them? See, the whole thing, it's a house of cards that without an objective moral standard, the whole thing collapses. It falls apart as soon as you start thinking about it. Because everyone draws the line somewhere. Everybody's got their box, and they say, no, what you're doing is wrong. Even the people who made that video, they're telling some people, you're wrong. How intolerant of them. Because you don't really mean love has no labels. Whoops, oops, things falling down. Uh, it, just, it just sounds good. Love has no labels. It sounds good until you start to think about it. Then it all falls apart. Remember the girl with the, with the disability? Uh, she looked like the younger girl, uh, her and her sister. She's actually 10 years old. Uh, the, the taller girl is her sister, who is 8. I, I did a little research. I, I kind of got in, invested in this. I was reading about the, some of the people. But the message is, love has no disability. And if they're saying that we ought to love people regardless of their ability or lack thereof, of course. right? We, we, we all know that already. I have a son with special needs. His name is Nathan. Uh, he has epilepsy. And Anthony, his big brother, loves him. And he cares for him and protects him because Nate needs help. And, and I almost break down every time I see that because that, that older, the girl who's younger, looks like the older sister, is caring for her younger sister. And, and that's, that's a picture of what goes on in my home because Nate has certain developmental delays uh, not to mention the fact that he could have a seizure at any moment, and we live with that reality. Uh, but there's, the, the fact is, he can't do everything that Anthony can do. But I would go as far as to say he does things that Anthony can't do. Nate can sound cute and sweet without even trying. You know, Anthony, he's 14. He'll talk like this, Dad, I'm sorry. You know, his voice is changing and everything. And, but Nate's like, Daddy, I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm sorry I dropped the bowies. Like, oh, I'm supposed to discipline. How are you supposed to discipline that? <laughs> it's, it's wicked cute, right? He doesn't call living water living water like Anthony does. He calls living water wing water. It's wing water. We, we'd have a therapist come to our house, and she would, she would say, um, and she'd be working with Nate, but she's really working on me. She's like, Mike, you got to get him to say la living water. Have his tongue touch the roof of his mouth. And, and I'm like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm kind of non-compliant. I'm like, no. I'm actually encouraging. I'll be leaving. I'm like, I'm off to wing water, you know, <laughs> to the disapproving looks of her and my wife both looking at me. But that's really cute. But Nate has, he has a disability. He does. We call it what it is. 
we, you know, we, we, sometimes we try to pretend, you know, that, that that's not the reality. I know the, 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 the intention is people will say, well, kids with special needs, they're just like all the other kids. And, and I know what they mean. I really do. If you're talking Imago Day made in the image of God, of course. But in a way, they're not. They're special. See, Nate, he, um, he rides a school bus to school. It's a lot shorter than all the other buses. He's in uh, the Special Olympics, not the other Olympics. And he has a nurse that, that, that goes with him everywhere he goes. We have a nurse show up at our house at 8 a.m. She's in our home hanging out with us while Nate's getting ready for school. She gets on the bus with him, goes to school, spends the whole day with him uh, there at the school, and then takes the bus home back to our house. These, these, these nurses are like family, you know. We're, they've been here to church, you know. So he, that's not like the other kids, you know. He, he can't play dodgeball. He can't eat all the foods that other kids eat. Those things make him special. We don't pretend that he's just like all the other kids. He's not. And, and I'm okay with that. I think that's true diversity. If you can follow me here, true diversity recognizes differences. It doesn't try to homogenize everyone. The people in that video were presented without any sort of distinction. We saw all kinds of different people groups. Yes, you got heterosexuals, homosexuals, different races, siblings, childhood friends, different religions, all kinds of different people, but they're implying that it's the same love. And I don't, I don't love my wife the same way I love my kids. They're doing a complete whitewashing here. Because if there are no labels, then there are no distinctions. And then there's nothing to be diverse from. You see that? You see how this, this falls apart? This isn't about diversity. It's about sameness. It's sameness without distinction. And let me just, just talk about the, the race issue there uh, really quick. I think this is another failure to, to think clearly. There's a difference between your being and your behavior. I like what uh, my friend Lisa Mays, she summed it up best. She goes, I can wake up tomorrow and change my behavior. I can't wake up tomorrow and not be black. You know, the, the fact is, she said that that's offensive to her. On the religion issue, you know, they, they did not make the case that, that uh, all roads lead to God. They came close. They came close, so I don't think it's, it's fair to try and straw man them and try and knock that down. But obviously, if you're saying you got a neighbor who's a Muslim, you know, a Hindu neighbor, yeah, love them. Go shovel their driveway. Bring them cookies. Become friends. Watch the Super Bowl with them. Yes, of course, we got that. But God, in his word, he makes all sorts of distinctions. All the time he's making distinctions. We see one right here in 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 6 says, love does not. There's a distinction right there. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. So the question becomes, what is wrongdoing and what is truth? And this is where everybody's got their perspective, their opinion, their thought. Well, here's how I see it. Well, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. The bottom line in this, God has spoken, and he has spoken with clarity. He tells us, two men... Two women sharing sexual love or marriage, whatever you want to call it, he says, you're messing with what I've decreed. He has not allowed for it. It's not an either or or an alternative. It's out of bounds. This would be like, like Cam Newton last week, right? Denver's defense beating him up. He decides to snap the ball and just run to the sidelines in the white area and just take off down the field in the area that separates the playing field from the coaches, and he's just booking right down there. What would happen? People are going to be like, um, what are you doing? You know, his coaches be yelling at him. Panther fans going crazy. They're like, you're doing it wrong. Why? Because there's boundaries. The NFL has established boundaries. They get to say so. They say that area is out of bounds. And the fact is, you know, I don't know if we like it or not, the fact is homosexuality is sin. And it doesn't matter what we think. God is in the driver's seat. Because he also calls my pornography sin. He calls my lusting sin, adultery sin. I submit there. And let's make this distinction. It's sin for people who act upon 
that desire. You know why? Because there's people within living water here, I know it for a fact. They struggle with this same-sex attraction. But they're living lives of integrity and respect and honor to God's law. We need to boldly yet lovingly declare what God has already said very clearly in his word. The objection is, I can't change. I was born this way. We heard in the song, I can't change even if I tried, even if I wanted to. Well, I think we ought to be very sympathetic to that. That was each one of us, right? Because unbeknownst to Mary Lambert, she doesn't realize, but that's some pretty good theology right there. You're right, Mary. You can't change, even if you tried really, really hard. See, homosexual behavior and sexual immorality are just simply a, a symptom of a much deeper problem. The Bible says that we are born in sin, slaves to sin, in bondage to our sinful ways. That was every one of us. Every one of us. We all need to be set free from sin. How does that happen? It's when we repent. We repent and believe in Jesus Christ. The gospel, it's about repenting of sin, not celebrating it. Doing that is like believing a lie. This goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, right? Satan shows up, what does he start doing? Lying. Speaking his native tongue. God says, in the day you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. Satan comes along and says, you will surely not die. A direct contradiction. Well, they're both right. No, they're not. They're not both right. Joseph Stowell puts it in his book, Far From Home. Uh, He says, Satan got them to believe two lies. One, God is not generous and good, but rather oppressive and restrictive. That's a lie. And that life is best and most expansively enjoyed when self is at the center, seeking satisfaction and sustenance in the material order, regardless of God's counsel and command. It comes down to this. Love can either be selfish or selfless. We, in our our perversion of love, we tend to be selfish. God, he's selfless in his perfect love. If you don't understand this, this this God's love, I don't think you understand the gospel. The the gospel is, is an outworking of this. Love elects sinful God haters instead of leaving them in their condition. Love leaves the glory of heaven to come to this place, right? To be born under the law and live a perfect life and die on a cross for the people he came to save. And love regenerates. It, it convicts and dwells within those former God haters and causes them to live lives worthy of the gospel. The gospel is a total outworking of God's love. You miss this, you miss the gospel. So what's the application for us? What, how do we understand this? What, what, are, what, what are we to do here? I'd say this. Demonstrate, because God's love is demonstrated. Demonstrate God's selfless love while speaking the truth in love. In other words, be loving, and at the same time, be biblical. What does that look like? Well, we'll close with this. I want you to imagine a scenario. Your child comes to you, says, Mom, Dad, I'm gay. What kind of love would you show? What would your response be? I have a real-life example to share with you. There's a young man named James. He came out to his dad. He said, Dad, I'm a homosexual. His dad responded by writing a letter to him. And I'll share it with you. I can do that because James posted it on the internet with the phrase, this is how hate sounds. The father writes, James, colon, uses a colon. James, this is a difficult but necessary letter to write. I hope your telephone call was not to receive my blessing for the degrading of your lifestyle. I have fond memories of our times together. That is all in the past. Don't expect any further conversations with me, no communications at all. I will not come to visit, nor do I want you in my house. You've made your choice. Though wrong it may be, God did not intend for this natural, unnatural lifestyle. If you choose to not attend my funeral, my friends and family will understand. 
Have a good birthday and good life. No present exchanges will be accepted. Goodbye, Dad. This happened last night to me. That's real. That is real right there. A real relationship between a father and his son. That ought to break your heart. A man named David Murray, he, he was so troubled by that like I am, he decided, I'm going to write a letter too. I'm going to write as if I had a son in a similar situation. So although it's, it's hypothetical, I want you to listen to this letter and listen carefully for 1 Corinthians love. Listen for the characteristics of God's love. Patient, kind, not rude, not irritable, not resentful. Not rejoicing at wrongdoing, but rejoicing with the truth. Bearing, believing, hoping, enduring. Listen for those. My dear James, comma, I'd rather say this man to man and face to face, and I hope I will have a chance to do that soon. However, to avoid misunderstanding and to assure that you have something in black and white you can keep and refer to, I want to make sure you know one thing. I love you. And I always will. I do not hate you. And I never will. Our relationship will probably change a bit as a result of your chosen lifestyle. But the love, my love for you will never change. I will continue to seek your very best as I've always done. In fact, I will probably by prayer and other practical means seek your good as I've never done before. Maybe... You've been afraid that I will reject you and throw you out of my life. I want you to know that I will always be well. I want you to know that you will always be welcome. I can't even see. Uh, text, email, phone regularly. I certainly will. We'd especially love for you to come home for birthdays and other special occasions. I hope we can continue to go fishing together and to share other areas of our lives. Listen to this part carefully. Your male friend may also visit our home with you, but we will need to discuss certain boundaries. For example, I can't allow you to share a room or bed together when you are here, and I will not allow open displays of affection for one another, especially in front of the other children. If you stay with us, you will attend family devotions, and if you are with us on a Sunday, you will come to church with us to hear the gospel. Perhaps these are boundaries They won't be easy for you to accept, but please try to understand that I have a duty to God to lead my home in a God-glorifying manner. Psalm 101 commands me to prevent sinful behavior in my home. While extremely anxious to preserve a relationship with you, I'm especially concerned that your siblings are not influenced into thinking that your lifestyle is fine with God or us. They're speaking the truth in love right there. I know that you don't like me calling your lifestyle and sexual practices a sin. However, remember, I've always told you that I myself am a great sinner, but I have an even greater Savior. I hope the day will come when you will seek that great Savior for yourself. He can wash us clean, white as snow. He is also able to deliver us from the bondage of our lusts and from everlasting damnation. I will not bring up your sin and the gospel every time we meet, But I do want you to know where I stand right up front. And also that I'm willing to speak with you about the gospel of Christ anytime you wish. I hope you will not call this message hate. This is how love sounds. I will always be your dad and you will always be my son. As I will never stop loving you and I will never stop praying for you. With all my love, dad. Let's pray. Lord, this uh, world is complicated. It's not easy to navigate. We need you to guide us. You know how things ought to function. We don't, and we get it mixed up. We get things twisted, and we need you to straighten us out, Lord. Please, will you do that? I, I pray that people are here today are are hearing love. I, I don't try to hold back the tears. I want people to see I care. This is genuine. This is love does the, what's best for the other person. It speaks the truth in a loving 
tone. And Lord, I apologize because my tone is not always loving. I don't want people to mistake my passion for anything but love. Lord, help us. Work in us. Guide us to live lives that glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray.